Today our speaker is Brother Ras. His title is Do Not Rely on Your Insight. Do not rely on your insight. And he has asked if we can be ready, all of us, to read from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3 from verse 1 to verse 8. Proverb 3, from 1. Don't forget what I teach you, my son. Always remember what I tell you to do. My teaching will give you a long and a prosperous life. Come. It's Proverb 3, eh? from 1 to 8. Never let go of loyalty and faithfulness. Tie them round your neck. Write them on your heart. If you do this, both God and people will be pleased with you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Never by rely on what you think you know. Remember, the Lord in everything you do. And he will show you the right way. Never let you yourself think that you are wiser than you are. Simply obey the Lord and refuse to do wrong. If you do, it will be like good medicine, healing your wounds and easing your pain. Let us give our, our attention to Brother Ras and give us the word about do not rely on your insight, Brother Ras. Thank you, Brother Ramazani, for the introduction. Good to see everyone and your faces this morning, uh, even though it's a bit chilly outside. <laughs> um, I was thinking as we sang this morning the first hymn, 165, would uh, teach me thy way. Um, it, we sing that we need to be following things more by faith, less by sight. So that's kind of the area that we're going to be talking about this morning. So this proverb, uh, the Proverbs, which uh, are really great. I, it, when I think about it, I think of uh, one of the brothers, Carol Thorson. He always loved the Proverbs, and they, they really are pretty astonishing. I think we'll hopefully be able to tie some of that in later with um, Jesus. I think it's pretty clear. So that... Verse 5 in Proverbs 3, your mind actually says, own your own insight. To me, it's like the ownership of, you know, your insight. So it's not, I just want to differentiate, it's not God's insight here, it's my insight. And I guess as we do the readings, or as I do them, um, you look at some of this and you realize, boy, I'm really kind of guilty of some of this stuff. Why did I do some of these things that are there? And as we go forward in this talk, one of the things that, you know, I've 
come to do over time is that, you know, a lot of people say, well, I've read the Bible, you know, I've read the Bible. But when you get to the stories, especially in the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, you got to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, I think. If you, if you can't do that, if you can't say, I wonder if this fits me, um, well, if you're not doing that, I think it's really good to do that because you begin to look at it like, ooh, yeah, there's some real meaning here. And you can see, I think, in my mind, how this was really, um, these stories were meant for us, but I think I've said it before, they were meant for his son to really strengthen him when he came to the crucifixion. I mean, they're just amazing stories when I think about it. So one of the stories I'm going to talk about right off, I know all the kids are going to know, is David and Goliath, right? That's a great story, one of the best stories. And the thing that caught my eye on this was uh, basically we know that Israel thought they couldn't win the battle. And we know that's in 1 Samuel 17. And it says all the men of Israel, and just think about this, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were much afraid. So they saw him and they fled and ran away. And they also said, have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. Have you seen this guy, how big he is? Uh, he's there to defy Israel. And then, of course, they explain, well, to David, as he comes there, anybody who takes him on and wins, they're going to have great riches. But David's answer is, okay, that's fine, but who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? That's his view on it. So he doesn't say, look at this guy. Look how big he is. You know, this guy is defying the living God. He's defying their armies. And so we can see there is, you know, David was not relying on his own insight he would, or the insight that the other men had. He relied on what God had provided for him. And another story that we read about is the spies going into the land. I think that's another one the kids know. They come into the land. And when they get in there, it's, kind of, it's interesting again. We know the 10 spies went in, and of course, two, Caleb and Joshua, said, no, oh, we can go in and we can see it. But the others come up with this metaphor, right? And, you know, again, it's what they're seeing. And the metaphor has to do with an insect. Does anybody know what that insect is? Grasshopper, right? We're like grasshoppers in their eyes. And you know what? We look like grasshoppers, too, in their eyes. So it's almost like they saw it, like, I can put myself in their eyes, these giants, because I know they see us as grasshoppers. And, you know, I think we are grasshoppers. And it's like, okay, that's what they saw. That's what they believed. That was what their vision was. And then what about Elisha? Remember his servant? Um, he went down to Bothan. Remember the king of Syria is like, every time I go to attack the Israelites, they know where I'm, what I'm doing next. How can that be? You know, well, I don't get it. And then, of course, his servants, the Syrian king's servant, says, well, it's almost like Elisha is in your very tent, and he hears exactly what you're saying, what your plans are for the next attack. And so the king's like, well, let's go down and get that guy then, because we can't have him around anymore. And so in 2 Kings 6, 15, um, he's surrounded, Elisha is, because they got to get rid of him. He just knows everything they're going to do next. Uh -huh. And so we remember the story. So when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, this army with horses and chariots was all around the city of Dothan. And the servant said, alas, master, what shall we do? What are we going to do? We're surrounded. And of course, we know Elijah said, fear not, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, I pray them, open, the, open his eyes, and that's his servant's eyes, that he might see. And what did he see? He saw, he, saw, he saw God's army around him, right? That's what the real situation was. So what he thought he saw, he thought, well, this, is, this does not look good for us. But then Elisha said, no, you need to see what's really going on here. 
So it says the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike these people blind, right? Blind. It's like we're talking, so what you're seeing is not what you're getting. So it's like, oh, okay, well, watch how this works. Just strike them blind. And, of course, we know after that, you know, the king of Israel wanted to kill him, but uh, Elisha said, no, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to feed them and send them back. And then they never had any problem with them, with that particular king uh, for a while. But, of course, that didn't necessarily keep the next king from coming down him. That was Ben-Hadad. And again, here's another one where Samaria is being besieged. So here's the northern kingdom is being besieged, right? And I think we all kind of know that story, and I'm not going to get into the, the gory details, but they really ran out of food. And it was really, really bad. And the king was in Israel was Joram, and he was Ahab's son. So he wasn't necessarily, he was actually kind of following the ways of his father, which were not good. And so because things got so bad, we know that he decided, well, I need to kill, you know, Elisha, as we would say, I need to kill the goose with the golden name. I need to get rid of the guy that's telling us what's right and wrong. And so that's what ends up happening, except Elisha, when they were about ready to get their hands on him, says, hear the word of the Lord. So he's saying, hear, you know, don't rely on your insight. Hear what God is going to tell you. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a measure of fine meal shall be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel. But the captain, who was the king's right-hand man, oh, what did he say? He said, if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this be? You know, can the Lord do this? And, of course, he did. So the response by Elisha was, yeah, but you're not going to see it. And why didn't he see it? He got trampled right on the way out so he never did see it so in essence he insulted god he blasphemed him that's the captain by saying eh, god can't do this he can't and i and i i hate to say it but i probably at times thought in my mind i don't think god can do this but he can do it and there's probably a very good story a strong story about him being able to do that so if we do follow the insight that we ourselves have ownership, and again, that's not God's view, uh, we can go down the wrong path easily. We can deceive ourselves, which is pretty amazing. Because Jeremiah tells us in chapter 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately corrupt. Who can understand it? Uh, probably a never truer statement ever made. Uh, like, how do we do this to ourselves? How, you know, and... Jeremiah said, I don't know how we do it. I don't understand it. But the Lord searches our minds and tries our hearts to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings, what he's doing. And, you know, just thinking about that right now, it's like this is one of the reasons we come together at this time. It's so we can examine ourselves because we know we have a heart that is deceitful. And we need to be looking at ourselves because it just doesn't go away unless we cast away our own insight and rely on God. And so another one that came with the kids would give was Adam and Eve. So I look at that, and sometimes I used to say, well, my Eve, well, she, got, she got tricked pretty quick. She was maybe stupid. But then the more I think about it, it's like, no, she wasn't stupid. She's probably very smart. God said he made everything and it was good. So she was no dunce, but she got taken in. She was deceived. You know, some people have told me uh, that they can't be deceived. And I'm like, hmm, well, you know, I, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But we know that Eve was deceived because Timothy tells us that in the second chapter. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, she was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet the woman will be saved. The woman will be saved 
through hearing, uh, through bearing, excuse me, children. If she continues in faith and love and holiness with modesty, she will be saved for that. But what about Adam? Um, well, Romans 5 tells us, therefore as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all men sinned. We can see that well, Adam had some flaws for certain, but he ended up being the gateway of bringing sin into the world. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about Adam doing that, but he certainly failed his helpmate. He didn't help Eve too much there. But we know, as we said earlier, Eve will be saved through bearing children and being, um, keeping her faith. And we know that too because also Romans 5 tells us, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift and the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin. It's not the same. For the judgment following one trespass Trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following the many trespasses brings justification. If because one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Then as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so one man's obedience, many were made righteous. So there's a big difference, isn't there, between Adam and how he acted and Jesus and how he acted. And we'll talk about that later. Like one's really there to help. And there are some situations where you kind of wonder, is that what I would want to hear if he was trying to help me? But as we look at those situations, I think we'll find out, yeah, we do want to be helped by somebody who really knows and cares about his sheep. So the second Adam, Jesus, really cares about the flock. He lays down his life for the flock. The first Adam... Not so much at the time. He got involved in the deceit that his wife got caught up in. But the second Adam, Jesus doesn't get involved in deceit at all. So the episode that we talked about earlier about what was happening in Samaria when Ben-Hadad's army came down and they ran out of food, again, the statement was by Elisha, hear the word of the Lord. And he goes on to tell them, as we said earlier, that things are going to get much better in a day, and they certainly did. Uh, one of the things, if you were at the class uh, adult study weekend a few years, years ago when Dwight Kindred was there, he talked about the Shema. And that's where they say, among other things, that the main thing is, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, is one God. And if you know about the Hebrews, at least the practicing ones, they say it twice a day at least. Once in the morning when they get up and before they go to bed at night. You know, they want to make sure that they drum that into themselves. And again, it's here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And somebody had made a comment. It's like, it's not like go watch the video, you know, go see what he's saying it's the comment was hear what he's saying listen to what he's saying so the key thing is it is to hear don't go watch a video understand what the Lord tells us don't listen to yourself when you get into a situation like that think of the things that happened in the Bible and see if they're not similar to what you are in they may not be obviously the exact same thing but they're going to be similar. And just as a little bit of a side, I was reading a book on Hamilton, and it's just amazing to me how the political views of that time are no different than today. And it's just amazing. So 
You know, Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. And so people think, yeah, no, my situation's different. And I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but you think, well, I'm different. I, I have different things. And my tangent is I remember when I first started working, well, we work in a food factory, so things are different than what they do in a uh, job shop. But find out, not really, not so much. They're pretty much the same, so I don't want to go any further on that. But listen to what God said. And again, I've heard, like I said, I've heard brethren saying, well, I can't be deceived. Um, and which makes me think of Joshua. You know, I, I couldn't compare, want to even try to compare myself to Joshua. But I think we're all familiar with the other story. Remember the story of the Gibeonites? What did they do? Well, they, they said, uh, hey, we saw what happened in Jericho and Ai, and you know what? We don't really want to run up against these guys. I mean, uh, who would? They don't want to do that. So what did the Gibeonites do? They said, well, let's kind of dress down. Let's look like we've been wandering around for ages. And it goes on to say that um, they acted with cunning. So this is what the Gibeonites did. And as we know, in retrospect, pretty smart. Um, but of course, we also know that they were not supposed, to, the, the Israelites were not supposed to attack anyone that you know, welcomed them, that didn't go to war with them. But it said they acted with cunning and went and made ready provisions and took worn out sacks upon their asses and wine skins worn out and torn and mended with worn out patch sandals on their feet, worn out clothes, and all the provisions were dry and moldy. I don't know how you do all of that. But they were moldy, and they went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgad and said to him and to the men that were in Israel there, we came from a far country, and so make a covenant with us. We know the rest of the story. So Joshua got faked out by that. And to think that I would never get deceived, it would be, well, it would just be wrong because we all get deceived. But we are pretty good at rationalizing our situation. You know, we, we also think of them how Abraham and Isaac passed their wives off as sisters. Like, not, not a good thing. <laughs> we know that wasn't good. The rationale, of course, was we don't want to get killed. So let's do that. And it's not going to, we're not going to have a problem. And one of the ones that I can tell you just in reading the Bible I had some trouble with for a long time was Esau. You know, Esau has to be like the ultimate rebel. Uh, if he's not, he's right, he's right up there with Korah, Dathan, and Byron, probably with Judas too. And he sells his birthright. You know, when you read, I read through it, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, well, he sold his birthright. You know, he was really hungry. Maybe I would do that. I mean, hopefully I wouldn't do that. But one of the uh, discussions about birthright goes like this. So this isn't, uh, this is somebody's editorial about it. It goes, well, why was the birthright important? The birthright is emphasized in the Bible because it honored the rights or privileges of the family's firstborn son. After the father died or in the father's absence, the firstborn son assumed the father's authority and responsibilities. In addition to assuming the leadership role in the family, the recipient of the birthright inherited twice that received by other sons. In case, there was, uh, were, in case where a husband might have more than one wife, and that, of course, we know did happen, the birthright always went to the firstborn son of the father and could not be awarded to the son of a favorite wife without proper justification. And that was from Deuteronomy 21. Well, Esau, we know, he despised his birthright. And if you go, and that was in chapter 25 in Genesis, if you go to chapter 26, um, it talks more about Esau. It said, when Esau was 40 years old, he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Bari, the Hittite, and Basimath, the daughter of Elan, the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. And you can read that they made life bitter for him. And I looked at the root word. It's kind of like when they were, the children were in Israel going across, wandering in the wilderness, and the bitter waters of Meribah. Remember that? That's what got the root word is this. So he just made life horrible for the two of them. And I can't hardly imagine that in a way, but... And then if you go to chapter 28 in Genesis, so when Esau that the, saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac, his father, Esau went to Ishmael and took wife besides the wives that he had, and he names who the daughters were. But 
you know, you think about that. He goes to Ishmael's side, you know, so his father Isaac, remember there was a separation because of Ishmael, and it's just like in your face type of thing. And we know that Malachi then commenting, looking back, says, well, wasn't Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? I love Jacob, but Esau I hated. And in Romans 9, Paul quotes that same thing, right? Now, he didn't have much use for him at all. And then later in Hebrews 12, Paul basically just lays it on the line. He just says Esau was godless. He didn't, you know, he had, he had no respect. You know, we talk about crocodile tears uh, that he had when he cried and he didn't get it. You know, it's like, well, he didn't really, he wasn't really that upset, but he, you know, it had to look like he's upset. As the crocodile, he looks like he's frowning, but before he grabs you. Well, there was a narrative that I read about Esau, and I thought, well, you know, this kind of is the way I feel about it, um, selling his birthright. It says Esau despised his birthright. We know that. In, uh, in, in Esau's mother and father's eyes, the deception may have been deserved. So I read through it, and I'm like, yeah, he deserved that. We know that Rebecca later aids and abets Jacob in getting the blessing, but you think this guy looking at Esau like he he probably deserved everything he got there. And I thought I could understand this deception. I was talking to Sherry about it, and but Sherry's like, yeah, but it, deception's deception, and it is. You know, as much as he may have deserved it, um, the deception wasn't correct. And we know the things that we're not going to go through them that Esau uh, that Jacob went through that shows that the deception was no good. So as I got into the New Testament, I was looking at some of the things and one of the parables that Jesus has, and I was thinking how we get deceived here. The parable of the sower, remember throwing the seed out on the ground and whatnot, and of course you say, well, I'm the one that was thrown on the good ground and everything went fine, you know, that's, that's who I am. But when you look at it, I begin to think, well, maybe, maybe I'm all of those. You know, maybe I fit into any one of those categories. And thinking about it, I think I do. Um, you know, the first one's thrown on the rocks. The birds picked it up. And I was thinking to myself, yeah, there are opportunities where the seed's thrown out there, maybe to talk to someone, and you're just like, nah, not today. I'm not going to do it. Um, and then they're gone, and you never see them again or whatever. And you think, wow, I maybe should have done that. Or you had an opportunity to go somewhere, and you decided, um, you know, maybe a uh, Bible school event or whatever, and you decide, nah, I just can't go. And so that opportunity or those seeds that are out there on the rock, they're gone. Um, and then we know it talks about this, the seed that gets thrown on the ground that starts to grow for a while, but then, you know, the sun comes out and bakes it. And, you know, you, I think we can think, or I can think I do that too. You know, you're, you're really excited about something, and then something else comes along. So you put it on the back burner and uh, the back burner of life comes out and you're like, well, I'll get to that later at some time. And then finally, the choking off. I can think of sometimes where you just say, eh, I want to do this anyway. I don't care what the deal is. You know, so you just choke off God's word. I'm going to go do this no matter how stupid it is. And you know, I, know, I know the Bible says don't do it, but I'm going to just allow it to happen. And I don't care. And this is the battle of deceit that I think we all have to deal with. And now we can see, I think, why, or at least I can, why Jesus had to be tempted in the wilderness. He got into these different situations because they, he needed to rehearse them. I think just like we need to rehearse them. Like, if I get into a situation, what am I going to really do? And we know that he listened to his father, and he was strengthened by that, strengthened because he listened and so one of the things I was thinking of in Proverbs 2, a couple chapters before what was read this morning, it goes on to say, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, if you look for it as for silver and search for it as a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. I say, store up the commands within you. 
accept my words and store them up inside you. And I think, wasn't that what Jesus was doing? And then you cry aloud. You want to understand it. And you'll get it. You look for it like it's a treasure that's lost. You know, I lost this thing, and I, I just need to find it. It's that important. And so here Jesus was in situations that, you know, I really wonder how I would have done. Feeding the 5,000 in John 6. All the multitude, they wanted to make him a king, right? And when they had eaten their full, their fill, he told his disciple, gather up the fragments left over that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the barley loaves left by those who had eaten. And when the people saw the sign which he had done, so they saw, hey, you know, they, they got the fact that he had multiplied all of the fish and the barley loaves. It goes, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. Jesus withdrew again to the mountain. They thought, this, nobody does these types of things. Let's make him king now. Do it now. And, of course, he left. He knew that it couldn't work that way. Same thing with Lazarus. You know, I, uh, Lazarus had to be one of the most pivotal pivotal events in the New Testament, or in the Bible, actually. And it says, when the crowds had learned that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11, um, then we go to chapter 12, they're ready to make him king. You know, it's like playing checkers. King me, king him. He's there. He's there. He's ready to go. John 12, 9 says, and when the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only on account of Jesus, but they wanted to see Lazarus, too, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus also to death. Now, let's kill Lazarus. And I'm not going to spend time on the rich man and Lazarus, but you just realize this is just so right into that parable. It's amazing. But let's go, let's go kill Lazarus, too. Uh, get rid of the evidence. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So people saw what happened to Lazarus with their eyes, and they decided, well, let's believe in Jesus, and let's make him, well, we'll see in verse 12. The next day, a great crowd who had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took the branches of palm trees. We all know this from our Sunday school class, went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. That's, you know, it's a done deal. We've got to do that. Well, we know that that was a fantasy. That wasn't just made up because later on the Pharisees say in chapter 12 of John, you see that you can do nothing. So they're saying to themselves, we can't do anything with this guy. He, look, look, you got all these people following. And then they, he finish it, look, finishes it with, look, the world has gone after him. They're going after him. They want to make him king. And it's just amazing when we see that in John 11, an earlier chapel, is remember the disciples begged Jesus, don't go back to Judea because they want to kill you. And of course, we just read, of course, they do want to kill you. And they're going to stone you, as a matter of fact. That's what they want to do. But this, again, Jesus knew how critical this event with Lazarus had to be in the overall plan to execute his father's will completely. No time to be deceived here. No time to say, well, I think that sounds like a better plan to me. Uh, I don't want to get in the way of all of these people. And then, of course, Jesus answered them in verse 9 of 11. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. So if you're you're not going to stumble around when you see the light of the world. But if you walk in the night, you're going to stumble because the light is not in him. And so as we read earlier in Proverbs 2, you can see this probably where Jesus picked this up. My son, if you accept my words, store up my commands within you. And that's Jesus said. That's the light that's within you. You've got to have that. And actually going back to Proverbs 4, it says something very similar, but the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over which they stumble. So you can see that he, Proverbs talking about stumbling in the night, wicked. Jesus talking about the same thing. 
And as Ramazani read earlier from Proverbs 3, God makes our paths straight. We're not going to go zigzagging around, even though we do. I mean, I have gone zigzagging. So you don't have to zigzag around. He'll make it straight if you follow him. And so I was thinking to myself, I think Ash was actually when Sherry and I were over in Israel, I was thinking of Jesus' crucifixion and, you know, stuff that I didn't personally think about too much. You know, we know he was outside the city where it took place. But I was thinking, well, what if he couldn't make that track? What if he was just too exhausted? What if he just, you know, you can't make it? Well, the Gospels tell us that somebody appears that helps him out. Who is that? Simon of Cyrene. So the Roman soldiers, they say, you, come here, Simon. You've got you to haul this for him. So Jesus was not going to die a different death, you know. He knew what he was going to, buy, to how he was going to die, because he tells us in John 3, you know, we always think of John 3, 16, you know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But two verses earlier in 14, he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the, in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. This has to happen this way. And God made it so that it did. And John, he says the same thing Jesus does in chapter 8. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and do nothing on my own. So he's saying, he says, it's not my, uh, my own vision of things, how it, it, things should be. It's not my own insight. But he says, but speak exactly what the Father has taught me. So he's doing exactly what God had told him to do. Um, and so we see he, he expresses complete confidence in what his father's telling him to do. I'm going to do that. And in that process, you think of the deceit that was probably involved again, more deceit. And that deceit had to do with the Pharisees and Pilate. Now again, some of you know that when people were crucified with the Romans, they didn't just take them down right away. Uh, you know, this was going to be a lesson that went on for, you know, as long as the birds were there to eat them. And so that's what they generally did. But in this particular case, we know that the Jews, so if you think about this, decided, well, we got to take him down. You know, it's the law. We can't have him up there. So he comes down. And of course, we know that then the Jews, the Pharisees, went to Pilate to say, you know, you need to go break his legs because n n no way did they not know that if his leg, if there was a body, parts of his body were broken, he couldn't be that lamb. They knew that. And so, hey, go break his legs. But, of course, they couldn't go there and watch it because they would be breaking the law of Moses. So they couldn't be there. So you just think, oh, how interesting is that? And, of course, the soldier gets there. And this deceit that the Pharisees had kind of riled up in their heads, and this is how we're going to do it. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, well, they didn't break his legs then. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and there at once came out blood and water. So you, you think of all the deceit that some of the earlier chapters, God doesn't need that. He doesn't need to do that. He can make things happen. I, I, I was thinking, you know, the seed thing. Think of uh, Mordecai and Esther, remember? Um, Mordecai kind of throws the seeds out to say to Esther when Haman's ready to kill them all, you know, you can do something. And she's like, well, I don't know about that. And, and of course, Mordecai says, but you're here for a reason probably to do that. And then she realizes she is. And what happens after that, you can tell is a pretty amazing story. So when those seeds are there, she picks them up and she doesn't cast them away. She takes them all the way. And because God is going to make things happen uh, that are right. So here we are with Jesus. Pharisees got this scheme in their mind. They propose they're going to do this. It doesn't work that way. And so Peter tells us in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. He wasn't a deceiver. Jesus didn't deceive. He didn't need to. And coming from Peter, it's kind of interesting to, for him to say that, um, I think, because 
Well, he tried to deceive Jesus to not go to Jerusalem, <clears throat> remember? And that famous Matthew 16, and Peter took him and began to rebuke Jesus. Now, you can't do that. God forbid, you can't do that. Kind of like, can God open the windows from heaven? Um, and then, of course, Jesus, uh, Jesus' response to him was, get behind me, Satan, you're a hindrance to me, for you are not on the side of God. You're on the side of men. So he was following his own insight. That's what Peter was doing. But Jesus didn't give up on Peter, did he? You know, and, and uh, he says to uh, Peter when, um, uh, in Luke 22, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail when you have turned again and strengthened your brethren. He said, I know you're going to come back and be fine. And what's the response of Peter? Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you. So the scenario that Peter had built in his mind of, hey, he's going to make Jesus king now, I die for you. But did he? No. You just see that scenario didn't work. That scenario was not going to work. It was a deceitful scenario. And Jesus tells him, you know, the cock is going to crow three times and you're going to deny me. So we see that where we get, you know, we see, we think our instinct's right. It's not right at times. It's only right if it's what God tells us through his holy word. But Jesus, like, unlike the first Adam, he's the true shepherd. He's the one that's going to tell you, like he just told Peter, I tell you what the right thing to do. Because I'm the chief shepherd, I'm the good shepherd. I'm not deceived. I don't tell lies. And we are so blessed this morning to be able to see that perfect example, the one who really wants to shepherd us and tell us what the right thing is to do. And as John tells us, you know, to us specifically, he's talking to others there, but he who abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. That's how we need to walk, follow his example. So here we are this morning, we do have that really Good opportunity to examine ourselves, see whose insight we want to follow, our insight or our Father's insight. And it reminds me of Proverbs 18, 24. There are friends who pretend to be friends, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So you can have friends like Peter was a friend, but he had a flaw. But there's really, there is a true friend out there, according to Proverbs 18, and that's Jesus, and that's who we keep in remembrance at this time.